Production. Recorded live. Hello and good evening to everyone who is on this call, University of Eucadia. I'm your host, uh, Franco Collins, and welcome. This Wednesday night, the 28th of September 2011. Thanks also to those who will be downloading the call later, either from TalkShoe or from University of Acadia. And as we say each week, the information that we'll be sharing tonight, including the information I hope a number of you will share in your questions live and chat, is for information and for education only. None of it should be taken as advice. And as we say, all the information you hear tonight or you may read tonight should be taken, should be tested, and if you have any doubts, please consult others. It's not supposed to be legal advice. Well, let's start tonight by summarising some of, not all of, because there are a number of areas we covered last week, but some of the key areas last week. And we're continuing on this theme of wills and testament, of getting to the heart of a state, getting to the heart of how these courts are functioning, what is the source of the authority of the Roman courts. And as we do this, we are trying to help each and every one of us find some remedy, if there is indeed remedy, within the Roman system. It hasn't been easy. As you know, there are many different opinions. Sometimes there are so many different opinions it makes it very, very difficult to determine what is true and what is false. I will be referring to some of the update material. There's been some fantastic research this week. I want to show you some things tonight that absolutely astounded me when it became apparent what we're dealing with. Probate law state law is a dominant form of procedure and function of the Roman system. And I say to you now, they are not closing the estates. The estate of your mother, your father, both for me who have passed, have not been closed. They may have gone through the ritual, the song and dance of probate, but those estates have not been closed. They're still open. The books are still open. The charges are still going against the account. They do not close the estate. Everybody is intestate. And we're going to go through these things very, very carefully. And in particular, we're going to focus on some more information and evidence on remedy that is making how we conduct ourselves in the office of the general executor more clearly and more effectively. So the format tonight is I want to share with you some of the update material and go through these things clearly. And the topic, as I say, for this call is firmly focused on probate, the state, the courts and their function with this, the knowledge that we've learnt that will strengthen us in moving forward in their courts. And I also want, uh, that'll be for the first hour. I also want to cover a couple of other areas. I want to talk to you about the misuse of documents, especially misuse potentially of documents from Eucadia. And the fact that all controversies, all controversies, whether they are raised in the Roman courts or whether they're raised in Eucadia, ultimately, if we are to be true ambassadors of the law, must be resolved. So let's get into it. The first hour, we'll cover this, and then the second hour, I look forward to your questions. I ask if you have questions, please hold them to the second hour, and then I'd love to hear from you by either pressing star 8 or hash 8 on the talk shoe or typing in your question. Well, let's start with some of the key research that we've uncovered. As we spoke last week, and indeed the week before on talk shoe, 
about the confusion, and it is deliberate confusion by the Bar Guild, of private and public law, and how to get a perspective on are we discussing private law, are we discussing public law, and indeed how the documents need to be framed. A document that is defined by statute as a certain form is to the Roman system considered a public document. To the Akkadian system is of course a private document. And what we must always remain careful is that we do not modify form that is explicitly stated in statute at the risk of inserting a private document and claiming it to be a public document in their system. This is a recipe for documents to be rejected out of hand. And in many cases, we've made it too easy for them to dismiss our documents as private documents, as defective documents, and therefore allow them to run forward because there is no effective defence. But there is another issue that I want to raise. There's an issue that we have spoken about in terms of presumption, but it is the presumption between a state law and corporate law. And let me explain what I mean by a state law and corporate law. When we look at the first constitutions of the states to which we most live in, created prior to the mid-19th century, we are, we are talking about a state law, law that was created under Henry VIII, and what we've been talking about when we talk about estates, deeds, notaries, testamentary trusts, trusts, and so on. But when we talk about the system today, we are in fact dealing with corpor corporate law, codes, corporations that appear to be exactly the same as the estate, but are an entirely different animal altogether. And what we haven't expressed clearly, and I hope we will now express clearly tonight, is that just as we state there are presumptions when one goes to the court itself, there are also presumptions when we deal with any part of their system, administratively and indeed when we deal with their public records. So that when we go to record an instrument, by default, we're dealing with the corporate recorder, the corporate lands department. We're not dealing with the estate lands department. And it's only when we are explicit that these instruments, and actually have it written on our instruments for the public record, if we don't make it explicit, then the presumption is it is corporate. And they, of course, as corporate policy, can create corporate policy that is totally contradictory to the estate law. So we'll investigate that further. A few weeks ago, I made the assertion, which I hope those that have listened to the calls and those that have gone to any of the court sites, and I'm going to give you a reference now. The court site I'd like you to go to is globe, G-L-O-B-E, hyphen, union, hyphen, court.org, globe, union, court.org. That's globe, hyphen, union, court.org and when you get there I ask if you please from the home page can go and have a look at the section which is entitled wills and testament and probate law a few weeks ago we made the assertion that under the corporations today they have deliberately placed us all into a state of intestate. That is, that the estates which they formed at our birth are being administered as if we have no will. Now, for some of those that are on the call, you may indeed have gone and created a will. 
gone to an attorney, completed a will in accordance with the statutes of the various state plantations, had it notarized, had it witnessed, and that will may well still be in custody with an attorney, or you may have taken it home. So you may be under the impression that you can't possibly be intestate because you have created a will. Let me explain how brilliantly simple it is. And if you hear thumping in the background, I apologise because we have a storm coming over over the next hour, hour and a half. The simplicity of it is that under the Wills Act of 1837, all wills must be recorded as being in existence into the court rolls. The court rolls being later the rolls that we call the county recorder and the court of, of official public record. Under the Wills Act of 1837, which is the parent act under the United Kingdom, which all the states then followed, all the Commonwealth then followed, if a will or indeed a notice of its existence is not recorded in the court rolls, then any document, even if it appears to be a valid will, is not a valid will, but a claim of a will. And all claims of wills, I'm just going to change to headphones to try and reduce the background noise. One moment. I hope you can hear me. Uh, please let me know if you can hear me on the call as I'm just changed to a microphone rather than to the open mic. Great. Okay. The simplicity, what they did, and it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, what they did was that they changed form, uh, they changed substance to form. Prior to 1837, if you go and look at notaries and you look at the history of notaries, you find that on all the instruments they state very clearly that unless the instrument has been perfected, and this is where we get perfected notice, then it does not have uh, legal effect. In other words, if it's not sealed by a notary, it, ha it does not have the uh, legal effect. But from 1837, what they did is they said that it is the publication of a notice that now gives it legal effect. That is, it's gazetting. Uh, that is, uh, it's recording that gives it legal effect. Now think about that for a moment. Think about one of the presumptions we've made, the emphasis of the notary. What I'm saying, and it is in their statutes, is that the role of the notary from 1837 by the corporations, the banks that took control of the British Empire, the Rothschilds, the Kazar, the Magyar banking families, the ones we've been talking about, when they took over and they started to reform the plantations, they made the role of the notary largely ceremonial. Now, if the role of the notary remained true today then it wouldn't matter at all whether your will was recorded whether the existence of your will was recorded if it had been perfected and it had been sealed by a notary and it could be held in due course by a notary it wouldn't matter what i'm saying to you is under the revisions that they made under the estate, not even the corporate, under the estate, the role of the notary became ceremonial. 